Welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Chapter 6, Current Digital Forensics Tools. So you have to keep in mind that this is kind of relative to when this was recorded. Tools change pretty often, so just kind of keep that in mind. We're going to be looking at how to evaluate the needs for the appropriate digital forensics tools, describe the available digital forensics software tools that are available, list some of the considerations for hardware, and describe the methods for validating and testing the forensics tools. I'm going to be honest and forefront with this. A big part of this is peer review. What is the industry looking at? What is the industry doing? That kind of dictates the tools that are being used. Because if the industry is showing that a specific tool is no longer valid or no longer useful, then you're using that tool. That just is going to be additional light shed on what you're doing. And that may not be a positive thing. One of the first and foremost things is look at the cost of the tool. Open source tools are pretty common, they're cost effective, and they are widely used. Again, you need to look at the peer review on the specific tool, but there's a lot of tools that are out there. Also, what operating system was the tool designed to work with? I work with Autopsy, which is really great in Windows. It has a Linux variation, but predominantly works better in Windows. So you got to keep that in mind. Is the tool versatile? Is the tool able to be taken in multiple areas? Different operating systems, different operating environments, things like that. Can the tool analyze more than one operating or file system? If your tool is specific to NTFS, does that help you analyzing a X T uh, format. It doesn't. The tool is geared towards that specific file system, so we need to understand that. Is there a specific programming language the tool is built on top of? A lot of tools are built using Python. Are there any automation features uh, as part of the tool? So we have to keep that in mind. And then lastly is what is the vendor reputation? I do a lot of in-case studies. I do a lot of working with in-case. However, the last several years, in-case reputation has been getting a little worse and worse, specifically because of the proprietary of their tool. So the reputation of the tool itself isn't bad, but their proprietariness of their image files is becoming uh, worse in, in reputation. So again, you need to look at the reputation of the tool just as much as the tool itself. Are there more than one type of tool? And the answer to that is yes, there's hardware and software, we already know that. Hardware tools can be a single purpose write blocker, or it could be a dedicated processing card, where software tools can be all different types of tools. It could be a graphical tool, it could be a command line tool, it could be a memory analysis tool that uses a combination of graphical and command line. It really just depends. The purpose of these tools, regardless of hardware or software, is they're used to copy, they're used to analyze, they're used to collect evidence of a target. That target typically could be a suspect's hard disk, mobile device, DVR system, it doesn't matter. The tools are going to help you collect and analyze data so that evidence can be presented. So the tasks performed by the digital tool is going to be based off of well, who's doing it. So the following is based off of the NIST's Computer Forensics Tool Testing Program. There's also an ISO standard, ISO 27037, and that's for digital evidence and the first responders. And the main categories for validating tools are acquisition, validation and verification, extraction, reconstruction, and lastly is reporting. 
So let's look at the first one, which is acquisition. Acquisition is essentially making a copy of the original evidence or the original drive. Acquisition could be uh, physical data copies or it could be looking at how to acquire that data via a tool graphically or through a command line. It could also be uh, in person, uh, live. It could be a remote capture through the network or it could be just memory acquisition. So it really just depends on how are we trying to make a copy of the original source. And that source could be a drive, could be memory, it could be a lot of other things as well. Since we are talking acquisition, we also have to understand there are different types of acquisitions. A physical copy, that's the entire drive, or a logical copy, and that's going to be a specific part of the disk partition. So maybe not all of the disk, but maybe a part of the disk. That's going to be dictated in whatever uh, granting body and the scope that they give you. Maybe you have a warrant that says the entire disk. Maybe you have a policy that says only a specific partition. So it really just depends on the, the granting authority's scope. There's also the format of the disk. So when you go to capture a disk for, uh, of a victim or a suspect, for example, how are you going to capture that? Are we going to do a disk to disk, disk to image? If it is a disk to image, what data format are we going to be using? Uh, typically going to be some type of raw data formats, but then are we able to take that raw format and be able to look at that content and we typically will view that content in a hex editor and this is just an example of one hex editor that's out there acquisition could also be uh, taking a large chunk of data and creating smaller segments of it that way it's more manageable instead of having a 200 gig file maybe we have 10 25 gig files, for example. And if you're doing a remote acquisition, this is more realistic based off of the size of the data we are going to be acquiring. So after we acquire anything, we have to verify and validate. Validate is a way to confirm the tool is functioning as intended. When we acquire a piece of evidence, for example, we will validate that the tool captured it correctly. Verification provides two sets of data that are identical by hashing. Validation is focusing on the tool. Verification is focusing on the process. If we cloned a drive, we would have to verify that the clone is identical. We could validate the use or the function of the tool by making sure the tool is performing its job as required. Validation and verification, we are normally looking at hashing of some, some sort. There are, a National Software Reference Library has compiled a list of file hashes for a known set of operating systems, applications, and images. But again, a hash is just a one-way calculation that we can use for integrity purposes. And here is the National Software Reference Library's website. And it has, again, a huge list of hashes that have already been identified. So if we're talking hashing, we need to understand that hashing is a hexadecimal value, uh, typically, that we can, we can look at, that we can analyze. So within the validation and discrimination portion, we could be looking at header values. So that header value is going to be, maybe we're looking at a document, uh, .docx. Well, that's going to provide a file signature. And that signature is going to give us that header value. It doesn't matter if it's a .docx. That's just for the operating system, for that extension. If the header says it's a doc file, then it's a doc file. It doesn't matter what the extension is. The common header value is what matters. And again, we look at that in hexadecimal. 
and that's called a file signature. We can actually rename anything. We can modify an extension so that it can be opened up with any program. But in reality, the operating system is going to look at the header file and that's going to dictate what it really actually is. If it has a .doc but the header says it's a PDF, well in reality it's really a PDF. Uh, if we have a JPEG that is hiding and as a word extension, well we can open the docx in paint because in reality the program is looking at the header not the file extension and that dictates what the file actually is. So we have to understand file signatures in the form of the hexadecimal uh, header. And we actually have labs for covering part of that coming up. So we also have to look at extraction. Having source evidence that is in a suspect's hard drive or a suspect's storage doesn't do us any good if we cannot recover the item, the artifact. And in order to do that, we have to extract it. And that is the recovery task for the investigator. And it's probably one of the most challenging because extraction doesn't always necessarily mean gracefully. So recovering data is the first step in analyzing in terms of the investigation cloning the drive, all, all of that's important, but the ability to, to extract information and make it meaningful is very important. So we also have to look at data viewing, searching, uh, looking at where data files may uh, exist but don't exist, where there might be intersections of multiple data files. So you might have to carve out a specific data file from a data dump, for example. Encrypting, decrypting, and then lastly is tagging data. So when we go to actually analyze information, we may have to tag what might be useful. So maybe our search warrant only gives us certain abilities to look for keywords. Well, would be only looking for those keywords. Anything outside of that scope, we wouldn't be allowed to do. Keywords are kind of important because that limits us what we're capable of doing. And again, the authority that's granting us the scope will actually tell us what we're allowed and not allowed to do. They'll provide us a scope of what we are able to stay, uh, or our boundaries. Here we have a OS forensics tool for analyzing certain material. This was a search index. So it was able to look at keywords and kind of where those tools are actually, or those key files are actually located. So word searching is sadly pretty common. Uh, we could be looking for a case sensitive. We could be looking for a specific file size. If we want to see a document that is between 100 megs and 200 megs, we could do that. Now, realistically, a .word document probably is not going to be that large, but I was just using that as an example. Extraction from the investigative perspective is looking at how to extract data. If there is encryption, then there are problems because Encryption is going to make the data unreadable. So for many password recovery tools, they do have a potential uh, password list uh, that's typically called a dictionary attack and that we can be using to try to decrypt files. Now, if encryption is present, it just makes the entire process that much harder to accomplish. After our extraction, we have our reconstruction. That is where we're looking at the evidence. So to recreate the suspect's drive so that we can analyze it. So if we're taking a suspect's physical disk and we're putting it to an image, that's a disk to image. Maybe we're doing a disk to disk that's taking the suspect's 
physical disk and cloning it to a new disk. Uh, maybe we're putting a already verified image and we're converting that to a physical drive. We could do that as well. All of those are classified as reconstruction. Reconstructing it so that we can analyze the data on that storage media. The entire goal with reconstruction is to recreate the suspect's drive or storage that we're being uh, analyzing. We're going to be using a lot of disk to image tools, uh, ProDiscovery or Linux DD commands. Those are the big two for disk to image copies. And when we're doing an exact copy, it's called a bit by bit copy or bit stream copy. The last main area is called reporting. And this is where we perform the analysis, the examination. We create the reports. We create all of the supporting documentation for the reports. We provide the timelines and all of that. This is where we bring everything together for our analysis. And this is what we would be submitting to our granting uh, authority whether it be law enforcement or HR, whoever is going to be granting us the authority to be conducting this work in the first place. Considerations for any of the tools are the reliability of the tool, the future expandability of the tool. Uh, are there any reputation issues with the tool? Is the tool flexible? Does it generate the same results over and over and over? That's important because I've actually had one a hashing tool that when I generate a hash for a file would always modify the hash a little bit. So that made that tool unusable. So the reliability and the validation of a tool is equally important. Keep in mind the tools sometimes are specific to the operating system. So we do need to have some exposure via command line and GUI based tools, both for Windows and Linux, because they're going to be the predominant tool sets. So for MS-DOS, the command terminal, uh, you're going to be doing that with a floppy disk. That might be the Norton disk editor or other command line tools for the configuration of the system. For Unix, we again, uh, Unix or Linux, you may still encounter specific tools for dealing with uh, that file system. The Linux platform is becoming more and more popular, so being exposed to how to collect evidence off of a Linux file system is important. There are tools like Smart that are designed to be installed on various Linux versions. They can analyze the file system. They can analyze plugins. They have utilities. And it also has a hex viewer for looking at content. We also have Helix 3, which is one of the easiest suites to use. You can uh, load it on a live Windows environment. You can have it as a bootable Linux operating system as well. And there are um, several courts that said this was okay. However, this is where the validation part comes into play. Some international courts have not accepted live acquisitions, so we do need to keep that in mind. If we are doing a live acquisition, are we in a jurisdiction that's going to allow that as evidence? It's not always can we collect the evidence, but will the authority granting service allow us to uh, enter it into evidence? We also have Kali Linux, formerly Backtrack, that has a lot of forensics tools built in. We also have Parrot Operating System, very similar to Kali, that has its own array of digital forensics tools that are already preloaded. We also have Autopsy and the Sleuth Kit. The Sleuth Kit is for Linux forensics. Autopsy was the browser interface for the Sleuth Kit. Autopsy is very heavily also used in the Windows environment, and we're going to explain this in more in depth in a later chapter. We also have things like uh, Force Point Threat Protection, and this was more of a Linux memory tool that expanded outside of just memory forensics or memory analysis. Other tools for graphical interface 
do exist. A lot of them have combinations of command line and graphical. One of the advantages for graphical, easier to use, multitasking, and no need to learn the older operating systems, you can just deal with the graphical component of that tool. There are some disadvantages, one of them being uh, resources. Typically, graphical does require additional resources, and it possibly can produce inconsistent results. However, that goes back to the validation of the tool in your review of which tool to use. It also does create some dependencies. Basically, the investigator becomes familiar with a specific tool, so that's what they use. Not necessarily that's what the best tool is, it just happens to be that is the tool the user knows, so that's what is being used. Technology changes quickly. Hardware changes, software changes. Hardware and software both fell. So we need to schedule our replacements accordingly. Maybe we look at the average age of a piece of equipment and then we figure out when we can retire that equipment or when is an appropriate time to get new equipment because of wear and tear of a specific piece of equipment. All of that comes into budgeting. The amount of time you're expected to have a workstation running, the failure of that workstation, the replacement of that workstation, all of that goes into the actual budget. Workstation is a consideration. Do we have a portable workstation, a lightweight workstation, a stationary workstation? Is there a balance that we have within those workstations? Do we have a laptop that is loaded up in memory but not enough hard drive space? So again, we're looking at what an appropriate workstation might be. All of that goes back to the lab requirements. What are the policies? What are the procedures? What are the guidelines that govern the technology use of assets for that lab? All of that comes into play. Is there a public lab requirement? Is there a privacy lab requirement? Again, all of those go into play as well. Building a workstation is not overly difficult. You do have to customize it. You do need to look at the resources that you're going to be utilizing and then you go for it. The disadvantage is it might be hard to find support for specific problems when looking at a specific uh, customized machine. If you encounter a hardware problem and it's a customized machine, you may not have a warranty. The workstation itself, if you are not mindful, can easily become expensive. The workstation itself can grow and grow and grow and become ridiculously expensive if you're not kind of keeping a lid on it. Some vendors do offer workstations designed for specific digital forensics. There are hardware mounts for forensics PCs. There are groups out there that make dedicated hardware for digital or forensics PCs. It really just depends. If you have to have a vendor to support your workstation, there are options out there, but you are going to be paying for it. You also have the ability to mix and match based off of your requirements. One of the core pieces of equipment that is needed, whether it's software or hardware, is a write blocker. That's the ability to prevent data from being written to the hard drive. That way, you can guarantee that there's no modification of a suspect's hard drive. When you have a write blocker in place, even when you're doing a clone of the drive, the write blocker prevents all data from being written to that drive. And again, it can be a hardware or a software option. You can navigate to the, write, uh, the blocked drive with any application. Again, everything is going to be temporary. There are going to be no hard writes to that source evidence. If we're dealing with a hardware connection, a hardware write blocker, maybe you're connecting it via Firewire, USB 3, SATA. Again, if it's a larger drive, you do want to use a faster connection technology because you're going to be taking data off of it. 
recommendations uh, for the workstation is again, how are we going to acquire the data? Is it in the field? Is it in your laboratory? Is it in the back of a work truck? And you have to be prepared. If you are doing this in the field, maybe a machine cannot be powered off. So acquisition might be in the field. So your write blocker needs to be able to go in the field with you. If you do want to reduce the hardware to carry, you might do a drive dock that has a write blocker in it that also has connections for FireWire and USB and SATA and so forth. When we're looking at a station or a lightweight workstation, assume expansion. Uh, as much memory and process power as your budget allows and also make sure that you have different size drives. You also need a large power supply. A 400 watt, I, I don't recommend that small. Uh, again, if you're connecting a lot of devices, you want power. So 800, 900 kilowatt or above. You also want the ability to have the add-on ports, FireWire, USB, and so forth. You also probably want a nice ergonomic keyboard and mouse. You're going to be working a lot of time on this workstation, so you want it to be comfortable. A good video card and a, an appropriate size monitor. Some of these hardware specs are definitely uh, older. I don't think you can get 17 inch monitors anymore. Realistically, 24 has been the standard for quite a while now. So. 24, 27, 32 inch monitors, an appropriate size monitor, dual monitor or tri-monitor where appropriate, uh, if your budget can handle it. If you have a limited budget, then one option for outfitting your lab is to have one end machine, not multiple. And oftentimes these are gonna be viewed as more like high-end gaming machines, high-end video, high-end memory, high-end processor, because that's what you would typically find in a gaming rig. But again, you can do the same type of thing in a forensic workstation rig. It's important to make sure that the evidence you recover is analyzed and able to be admitted into court. So that means you must test and validate software and the processes just to make sure. And all of that goes into the appropriate policies and procedures of your lab. Do you have a lab for chain, or is there a policy for chain of custody? Is there a policy for hashing source evidence files when cloning them? Are you following appropriate policies and procedures? There are guidelines, published articles, tools, procedures, for testing and validating everything. NIST has already created the forensics testing uh, benchmarks so that you can validate your tools. Your lab must also meet very specific criteria if you are doing this professionally. Establish categories for digital forensics tools, uh, develop test assertions, test cases, establish a methodology, report tests, and verification, auditing, check, make sure the tools are doing what they say they're doing, spot check. Don't just assume that it's always going to be functional. NIST has also created the National Software Reference Library Project. We've already talked about that. That's a well-known hash value for commercial software applications, operating systems that you can filter and that you can retrieve hashes for a specific tools or operating systems. The acquisition all ties back to the validation. Make sure you have a solid validation protocol. Use at least two tools. Double check. It doesn't hurt to have the analysis done by two separate tools. That way, you can always be sure your findings are solid. And again, write your report outlining both tools or more that you've used. Make sure that we have disk editors and they do not have a flashy interface. Make sure they're reliable. Make sure the tools are forensically sound. Make sure that the tools have been verified by peers and are acceptable in the industry. 
make sure that we have appropriate upgrades paths. So if you have a tool, is there a pathway for upgrade? Is there a specific structure for wind upgrade? Consult the business plan for knowing when to get the appropriate hardware and software. Make sure you have a budget for the hardware and software. Make sure that all of your hardware and software is appropriate licensed. That's been an interesting one because you can have a software tool that you download as a trial that may not be used in an actual case. So you do want to maintain a software library of your lab. What versions, what update paths are there, licensing options, all of that is critical. All right, so that completes this lab. So we've looked at hardware software tools, We've looked at command line and graphical tools. We looked at kind of the options for choosing the hardware and software. And we also kind of looked at the importance of validating our software and hardware before conducting any tests. Questions or concerns, reach out. Thank you. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is, as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.